Good morning. Please open your Bibles to uh, James 4. Uh, my name is Blake Lawson. As Paige introduced me, I'm a pastoral resident here. I've uh, been here for about nine months, so one pregnancy. And uh, I've had the opportunity to, um, to uh, preach at all the various campuses, but this is my first time here. So truly it is a privilege uh, to be here with you all and to worship Christ with you all. And I'm looking forward to diving into God's word together. So again, if you would turn your Bibles to James 4. Uh, as you're turning there, I'll tell a quick story. Uh, one year ago, on October 25th, 2022, I was uh, wrestling with a few things internally, and I was seeking the Lord through God's word and through prayer. And I just so happened to come across a verse uh, that instantly brought comfort to me and that has been a source of encouragement to me ever since. Now, this verse, and uh, don't turn there yet, by the way, because I want to test you guys on something. This verse is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And in this verse, Paul describes the emotion, the emotion that will flood the hearts of believers the moment Christ returns with his mighty angels. So let me ask you, and maybe think to yourself or maybe whisper to your neighbor, if you were to pick one emotion, one emotion that you think will flood the hearts of believers the moment Christ returns, which emotion would you choose? What do you think you will feel in that moment? Maybe I heard joy, joy, or maybe gratitude, someone mentioned to me after last service, or maybe fear. I think of Isaiah in Isaiah 6, or, or maybe worship, or reverence, or contentment, or peace. What if I just stood up here all day and just listed every emotion there is? <laughs> My guess is that believers will feel all of those emotions and more when Christ returns. And yet, curiously, Paul doesn't point to any of those emotions to describe what believers will feel the moment Christ returns. Which emotion does he point to instead? According to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, the emotion that will flood the hearts of believers the moment Christ returns is relief. Relief the complete unburdening of a lifetime's worth of stressors and sorrows and sins and sicknesses and suffering in a single moment. That decompressing exhale our souls so desperately long for but never quite seem to manage in this life. Relief. And I think part of the reason why verses like these are so hope-giving to many of us, myself included, is because this world in our lives are filled with so much conflict. In fact, in every moment of every day, including this moment right now, each and every one of us are engaged in three different conflicts. Each of us are battling conflict within us, right? So that ongoing struggle with sin and suffering Conflict around us, so that's conflict with other people in our lives, as well as the conflicts that are happening around our nation and around the world. And then you might say conflict beyond us, so in the spiritual realm. Remember, Paul says in Ephesians 6 that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers of darkness. All of our lives are spent waging these three wars. And man, doesn't all of this conflict get exhausting? Don't you long for Christ to return to bring relief from all of this conflict? I know I do. And praise the Lord, praise the Lord that he will. But what about now? What about now? How can we live as Christians without getting just absolutely beat down by all of this conflict, without being crushed by all of this conflict? And what's more, what happens when we realize, when we look inside ourselves and we realize that much of the conflict in our lives originates in us? What happens when we realize that we are the source of a lot of the conflict in our lives? What hope do we have? Our text for today points us to three things, three things that we must pursue if we want to live faithful, hope-filled lives as believers 
even in a world full of conflict. So let me pray for us, and then we will dive into our passage for today. Lord, we do pray that you would do just that through your Holy Spirit, by your word today. Lord, fill us with hope so that we could respond to conflict in ways that would honor you and in ways that would reflect Christ to the world. We pray these things in his name, amen. How can we live faithful, hope-filled lives as Christians, even in a world full of conflict? According to James 4, verses one through 12, we must do three things. We must, number one, identify idolatry. Number two, cultivate humility. And number three, let grace be grace. And I'll explain what I mean by that when we get there. Identify idolatry, cultivate humility, let grace be grace. So let's look at these one at a time, starting with identify idolatry. Now we see this in verses one through five, so please follow as I read. The Holy Spirit says through James, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions, or other translations say desires, are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend it on your passions, or again, desires. You adulterous people. The word here is is literally adulteresses almost as if to say that we as the bride of Christ commit adultery against our Lord whenever we live in idolatry. Let's keep reading. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Now, commentators note that verse five is difficult to interpret, but it is at the very least a continuation of the marriage imagery from verse four. So verse five is is saying that Christ himself longs for you like a bridegroom longs for his bride. Christ desires you and he yearns for your full affection and devotion two things that are threatened by idolatry. Now you say, you keep saying idolatry. Like, what are you referring to? Are you talking about like bowing down to a golden statue? Because I don't do that very often, or hopefully not at all. (laughs) That is one form of idolatry, but the Bible's view of idolatry is actually much more expansive than that. Scripture indicates, and this is up on the screen, Scripture indicates that we commit idolatry anytime we look to a created thing to be something that only God can be or to give us something that only God can give us. That's idolatry. So you say, well, how, how can I know if I'm doing that? Great question. Thank you. That sets me up well. <laughs> these, these verses show three indications or indicators or what I'm going to refer to the rest of the sermon as symptoms, three symptoms of idolatry in our hearts. And these are up on the screen. If you see these symptoms in your life, you can likely trace it back to an idol in your heart. What are these symptoms? We see at least three in this text. Number one, inordinate desires. Number two, covetousness and or envy. And number three, murder. <laughs> uh, Let's look at these one at a time. I don't know why I laughed when I said murder. That was probably not the best time. (laughs) Notice again, verse one. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions or desires are at war within you? Tim Keller says that idolatry happens whenever we turn a good thing or a good desire into an ultimate thing or an ultimate desire. Uh, My parents said, when I was a little kid, I used to do this with Bears games. So whenever the Bears lost, which was often when I was younger and actually my entire life, um, <laughs> whenever the Bears lost, I would literally lie down on the kitchen floor and weep. <laughs> and then I would be in a bad mood the rest of the day. And my parents would say things to me like, Blake, it's good to want the Bears to win but it isn't a need as much as it may feel like it in this moment. Weeping on the kitchen floor 
was a symptom of idolatry in my heart. I had elevated bear's winds from a good thing to an ultimate thing. Now I will admit, I am still a big Bears fan today. That didn't go away, but I can say that I no longer weep on the kitchen floor after Bears losses, so that's progress. I go to my bedroom to do that now. (laughs) The first symptom of idolatry is inordinate desires. Whenever we turn a good thing into an ultimate thing, now we are good at this. We can make idols out of anything. Uh, John Calvin famously said that our hearts are idol-making factories. So we, we can idolize comfort or wealth or romance or popularity or a new house or a new car or a new job or a new dress. Any time that we look to a created thing to be something that only God can be or to give us something that only God can give us, we commit idolatry in our hearts. So the first symptom of idolatry is inordinate desires. The second symptom we see in these verses is covetousness or envy. And look back at verse two. It says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. And we'll come back to that in a moment. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Now, other translations, some of your translations might use the word envy instead of covet. Now, both of these words are evil words. They're they're bad, envy and covetousness. But envy might be a little bit even more evil. And here's why. Covetousness says, I refuse to be happy until I have what they have. Now that's bad, (laughs) it's not good. But envy takes it a step further and it says, I refuse to be happy until I have what they have and they lose what they have. Here's how Gavin Ortland put it and these are up on the screen. Uh, Thomas Aquinas defines envy in four words. Tell me if there are any words more evil than this. He defines envy in four words, sorrow, for another's joy. Wow. Ortland says, just think for a moment about how squarely malicious envy is based on this definition. In fact, envy can be thought of as the opposite of love. Love says, I am happy when you're happy and I am sad when you're sad. Envy says, I am happy when you're sad and I'm sad when you're happy. Ortland says, could anything be more terrible? Envy is a close sibling of hatred. Whereas covetousness is an inordinate longing for something that someone else has, envy goes further, also wanting the other person to lose what he or she has. Wherever envy exists, hatred and idolatry also reside. Three symptoms of idolatry we see in these verses, inordinate desires, number two, covetousness and or envy, third and finally, murder. Now I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, <laughs> but I, I, my guess is that most of us would not raise our hands as being guilty of murder, hopefully. And yet, according to James and Jesus, anyone who has been sinfully or spitefully angry with someone in their life has already committed murder in their heart. Look back at verse two for a moment. It says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. Now, Paul David Tripp, he's up on the screen there. He might have the best commentary on these first three verses of chapter four. He also might have the best mustache in the world, as you can see in that picture. He says, idolatry happens whenever we turn a desire into a demand. So see if you can recognize this digression in your life. He says, uh, when this happens, I want something, turns into, I need something, turns into, I must have something. And here's why this is so dangerous. If someone gets in the way of something that you merely want, no big deal, brush it off. Like let's say that you really, really want cookie dough ice cream one night. So you walk over to the freezer, you're super excited for this cookie dough ice cream, you open up the freezer and it's gone. Your, your wife or your sibling ate the rest of it. Or worse yet, they ate the rest of it and then they put the empty carton back in the freezer. <laughs> now in that moment, if, if ice cream was something that you merely wanted, how do you respond? Well, you say, oh, huh there's no more ice cream left. Well, I'm so glad that they got to enjoy the rest of that. 
And you know what? It was actually really thoughtful of them to put the empty carton back in there so that we know, hey, we need to go get some more ice cream. That was so thoughtful. That's how we respond. That's how we always respond, right? In that situation. If that's how we respond, if, if someone gets in the way of something we merely want, but when someone gets in the way of something we feel like we must have, something that we are idolizing in our hearts, at least for that moment, that other person becomes our enemy. They become someone who in that moment, we have to try to avoid that other person to get to that thing that we must have, to get to our idol. They become someone who in that moment, consciously or probably most of the time subconsciously, we think, man, my life would be better in this moment like if you, if you weren't here. We commit murder in our hearts. And by the way, I didn't intend on sharing this initially, but spiritual murder, the ironic thing about it when we commit spiritual murder is it's actually us who dies, right? Like you guys have heard the quote of, harboring bitterness in your heart is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Spiritual murder does the same thing. James goes into more detail in verse four when he says, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, what does James mean by enemy? Doesn't that seem a little bit dramatic there? Here's what I think he means, and this is up on the screen. God and people in our lives become our enemies whenever we feel like they are keeping us from getting something we have idolized in our hearts. We think subconsciously, man, my life would be better in this moment if if you weren't here. And typically when we have that idol in our hearts, that moment that will spill out in anger or frustration or bitterness. So how can we identify idolatry in our lives? Check for these three symptoms that we looked at. Inordinate desires, so that's when we turn a good thing into an ultimate thing. Covetousness and envy, so that's when we say, I refuse to be happy until I have what they have or they lose what they have. And murder, when we say consciously or subconsciously, my life would be better in this moment if you weren't in it. You are blocking me from getting something I must have. These moments in our lives are breadcrumbs that are meant to lead us back to idols in our hearts. So when you notice these symptoms in your life, ask yourself the same question I have been asking myself this last week as I've been studying this passage. What am I idolizing right now? In what area of my life am I asking a created thing to be something that only God can be or to give me something that only God can give? So what do we do once we've identified idolatry? Do we just throw our hands up in the air and say, well, I, just, I guess I am who I am. <laughs> It would be very weird if I said, yep, that's it, go in peace. (laughs) Fortunately, God's word, it doesn't only help us identify idolatry, but it also helps us cultivate humility. And that's what we see in the rest of our text here in verses six through 12. Uh, So please uh, follow along as I read now verses six through 12. It says, but he, that is God, gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. By the way, real quick, we'll come back to this in a moment, but this isn't God being a cosmic killjoy here. This is a very clear picture of repentance. Apparently, there were some people in the first century church who felt no conviction over their sin. It sounds like they were taking it even a step further in celebrating their sin or even laughing at it. And James is saying, no, no, no. Let your laughter be turned into mourning. Don't celebrate something that's bringing death to you. Instead, turn, turn to God in repentance, something that according to Acts eleven eighteen 18, will bring life to you, will give you life. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks evil against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Really quick, 
uh, note on verses 11 through 12 there, uh, James here is being super frank. And James is a super frank guy. And in those last two verses, he's saying basically, you and I, you have enough sin in your own life to worry about. Who are you to condemn others? Now he's not talking about lovingly holding a brother or a sister accountable. He's talking about spitefully condemning others while ignoring our own sin. He's talking here to people who are quicker to see the sins in others than they are to see the sins in their own lives. James here is preaching the same message that his brother Jesus preached on the Sermon on the Mount when he said, take the log out of your own eye before you try to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Okay, so we just looked at three ways to identify idolatry. Let's consider two ways to cultivate humility from this passage. First, As we saw a moment ago, arguably the best way to cultivate humility is to live in ongoing repentance. Now we just saw verses seven through 10, they are largely about repentance, but verse eight, verse eight gives a really interesting detail about God's heart toward us when when we come to him in repentance. Notice again what it says in verse eight. It says, draw near to God. Now you might add here through repentance, because that that is the context of verses seven through 10. Draw near to God through repentance and he will draw near to you. Notice what this passage does not say. Notice that it does not say draw near to God through repentance and he will flee from you because he's way too holy to be around sinners. Notice that it does not say draw near to God and he will consider whether or not you are worthy of his grace and forgiveness. Notice that it does not say draw near to God and he will he'll hesitantly draw near to you, but probably with his nose plugged and those rubber gloves on, you know, because we are dirty, filthy sinners. It doesn't say that. Notice what it says. It says draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I think one of the most beautiful, poignant pictures of this comes in Luke 15 in the story of the prodigal son. Do you guys remember this story? So the prodigal son, he spoils all of his father's inheritance and he goes and lives in sin. And then one day he realizes, I need to repent. I need to turn back and go to my father. And so he goes back to his father. And I like to picture him still having pig slop all over his body and dirt on his face and maybe flies buzzing around his head. And he comes back to his father in repentance. And do you remember what his father does? He runs to him and he throws his arms around him and he kisses him, even in the midst of his uncleanness. And so Christ does for us. He isn't afraid to embrace us after we sin. He doesn't wait a few days for the odor of our sin to kind of go away before he draws near. When we draw near to God in repentance, God runs to us in forgiveness. That's the message of James 4, 8. So the first way to cultivate humility is repentance, but there's a second way to cultivate humility that is particularly important when we are tempted to envy others as we saw saw in verses one through three. So let's say when we were talking about verses one through three, you identified envy in your life and you're like, that's me. How can we cultivate humility when we feel envy in our hearts? Well, there's one habit that I wanna point to that practicing this habit has been transformational in my own life, so I'm excited to share it with you, and that is seeking others' blessing. Now, in order to explain what I mean by this, I wanna share a testimony from my own life. One of my favorite pastors to listen to and to read, other than uh, Pastor Jeff and Pastor Brian and all the pastors here, of course, is, uh, is Gavin Ortland. So you see his, his picture on the screen there. So Gavin is on the left, and on the right-hand side is Gavin's brother, Dane Ortland. Now, Dane Ortland wrote a book called Gentle and Lowly. Have any of you guys happened to hear of this book, Gentle and Lowly? Okay, a number of you. It is so good. It's like one of my most recommended books. So if you're looking for a book to read, read Gentle and Lowly. So Gavin Ortland, he tells this story um, of when Gentle and Lowly was first published. I think it was 2020. 
And that book skyrocketed. It was one of the most successful evangelical books of the last decade. It's sold over three quarters of a million copies already in just a few years. And so Gavin Ortland, the brother of Dane Ortland, tells a story of when Gentle and Lowly first started selling. He said that people uh, would regularly come up to him and say things like, oh, your brother, your brother is an amazing author. Your brother's book actually changed my life. Let me ask you something. Have you thought about how insightful your brother is? You know what? I think your brother has a gift. He said some people would even come up to him and say, oh, you're Gavin Orland. Like, oh, did you write Gentle and Lowly? And he'd have to be like, no, you know, that was my brother. So he said, I, Gavin Orland said, I made a commitment early on in order to combat temptations for envy and covetousness. He said, I made a commitment early on that whenever anyone came up to me and mentioned Day Orland or mentioned gentle and lowly, he said, I used that as an alarm clock to immediately stop in that moment and pray for Day Orland's greater blessing. Pray that his book would sell more copies and influence and impact more people around the world and point more people to Christ and that the Lord would bless Dane's ministry more. And he said, I, I wanted so many books to sell that everyone in the world got a book. Actually, I wanted so many books to sell that everyone in the world got five books and then we would have to ship it into outer space to give it to the aliens too. Now, when I heard about Gavin Ortland's practice, I identified three men in my life of whom I'm tempted to envy. And interestingly, I was tempted to envy them in three totally different areas of life. And what I did is I started praying for them every single morning when I woke up. And not just vague prayers, but prayers for their greater blessing in the particular area that I'm tempted to envy. <laughs> praying that they would be blessed more in those areas, more successful in those areas, flourish more in those areas. And what I noticed over the course of a month or two of doing this every single day is two things happened. Number one, my temptation to envy these men decreased significantly. And number two, my genuine desire to see these men succeed in life increased. My love for these men increased. One of the best ways that we can cultivate humility and disarm envy is to pray for and pursue the greater blessing of those in our lives who we are tempted to envy and then watch and see what God does. How can we live faithful, hope-filled lives as Christians? Even in a world full of conflict, we must identify idolatry, cultivate humility. Third and finally, we must let grace be grace. There may not be any sweeter words in the entire book of James than the first five words of verse six. You guys see those words? But he gives more grace. Grace that is greater than all of our sin. Though our sins are many, his mercy and grace is more, which we'll sing about in a moment when I first moved out of my parents' house, I had a bad habit of buying those singular soap dispensers. So I, I wouldn't buy the jug that then you'd refill later. I thought, hey, if I just buy the singular soap dispenser, you know, it, it'll save me money in the long run, but it, it actually doesn't. Um, but what would happen often then is that as I would use that singular soap dispenser, it would very quickly run out. And then I would get to the bottom of the soap dispenser and there's, there'd still be some soap left at the bottom, but it wouldn't dispense anymore. Have any of you guys been there? <laughs> yeah. And so what I would do is I would unscrew it and I would pour some water in it and then screw it back and then shake it around to try to get out whatever soap was left. And it actually worked surprisingly well, but then of course the soap was, was diluted in there. So, so you might say that when the soap got really low, I would say to myself, soap alone, is no longer going to work to cleanse my hands. I need to mix in some water to get it to work now. Now we have a tendency to view God's grace in the same way, don't we? We think that there is a limited supply and that with each application, his grace slowly begins to run out on us. And eventually once it gets really low and we feel like, oh, I feel like I'm maybe at the bottom of God's grace, we think to ourselves, grace alone is no longer going to work to cleanse me. I need to mix in some of maybe my own guilt or my own good works in order for his grace to be effective. And that notion of grace is exactly the opposite of what James 4, 6 is teaching. 
That little phrase he gives more grace is communicating that God's grace never runs out for the believer. There isn't a limited supply and you never have to mix in your own good works in order for God's grace to be effective. In fact, as we just saw in this, in this passage, idolatry, that's something that we must identify and try to put off. Humility, that's something that we must pursue and cultivate. But grace, that's something that we must simply receive. Verse six says that God gives more grace. Our job is not to work for God's grace, but to simply let grace be grace. Don't dilute it with your own works or guilt. Trust in God's amazing grace for you. Isn't it interesting that in this passage, James tells us in verse seven to draw near to God before he tells us in verse eight to cleanse your hands. Whether you are already trusting in Christ today or whether you feel the Holy Spirit prompting you to put faith in him today, don't fall into the trap of thinking, I need to clean myself up before I come to God. Come to God with all of your uncleanness and let his grace cleanse you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your amazing, lavish grace that comes through Christ and his perfect sacrifice on our behalf. Oh Lord, triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we love you and we need you and we thank you for all that you have done for us. Lord, I pray that as we go today, Lord, that we would go out with the hope of grace and with a desire to continue to walk with you in worship. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. I can't think of a better way to come to the Lord's table, if you grab your cup, uh, than with a fresh reminder of God's grace for us in Christ. You don't have to be a member here in order to enjoy this meal with us today. As Pastor Jeff likes to say, this is not Chapel Street's table. This is the Lord's table, and all that matters is two things. Number one, that you have put faith in Christ and that you are trusting in his perfect atoning work for the forgiveness of your sins. And number two, that you are willing to examine your heart today and look to God for grace. And if that's you, this meal is for you. If you have not yet put faith in Christ and you feel the spirit prompting you to do that today, please come and talk to me or talk to one of the pastors after service or maybe the person that you came with and we would love to walk with you in that. But for all of us, let this meal be a reminder that we have a God who gives more grace. So come confidently to this meal today, remembering that though our sins are many, his mercy is more. Now, as you peel back the top layer and uh, take the bread in your hands, hear the words of institution. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink with grateful hearts. For as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's victorious death until he comes in glory. Amen. I don't know that there are any better words that we could leave today with, words that should be ringing in our ears for the rest of this week. Praise the Lord, though our sins are many, his mercy is more.
Just a reminder for newcomers, there is a meet and greet in the lobby today uh, over by the Connect uh, banner over there. So please be sure to join us for that and say hello. Uh, and for all of us, let me uh, close with the benediction. Now may the love of God the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.